We are covering lots of elections Tuesday evening. There are primaries in Colorado, New York, Illinois, Oklahoma, and Utah, runoffs in Mississippi and South Carolina, and a special election in Nebraska. New York's drama-filled House elections have been pushed back to August because of the back and forth over redistricting, but there are still dozens of interesting races taking place on both sides of the aisle Tuesday night. And here with us to talk about them is elections analyst Nathaniel Rakich. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Galen. Thanks. So, Nathaniel, as you have probably realized, because we blew past the time when I said we would be recording with you, we talked a lot about the Supreme Court this morning, which means Ooh. that we are tasking you with explaining everything we need to know about Tuesday's primaries in 10 minutes or less. Do you think you can do it? Yeah, no problem. It's just like the second busiest primary day of the year. <laughs> Was that shade? A little bit. All right. Well, you know, I, I, you know, I can handle a little bit of shade, but let's dive right in and not waste any more time. And we're going to begin with the Illinois governor's race. So there are three candidates leading the Republican primary to run against incumbent Governor J.B. Pritzker, State Senator Darren Bailey, Aurora Mayor Richard Irvin, and venture capitalist Jesse Sullivan, who all sit on distinct parts of the ideological spectrum. So in 60 seconds or less, Nathaniel what do they represent and what is ultimately at stake in this Republican primary? I think what's at stake here is whether Republicans have a prayer in the Illinois gubernatorial election in November. Um, Richard Irvin is the kind of more moderate candidate. Um, he has actually been um, attacked by Democrats because they don't want him to be the nominee. Um, and, and Darren Bailey, by contrast, is the Trumpier. He, he's been literally endorsed by Trump candidate. Um, I think if Bailey were to win, um, because Illinois is so blue, um, and Bailey is kind of this, you know, national Republican pro Trump figure, he would have real trouble winning. Um, but Irvin is an interesting candidate and maybe could have made the race competitive, but it looks like Bailey is going to win this primary. So it may be a moot point. Okay. So Sarah, Illinois is a blue state. Of course, we're in an environment that could be potentially favoring, likely favoring Republicans in the fall. You would think that the electorate, the Republican electorate in Illinois would say, hey, we want a Republican in the governor's mansion. Let's maybe vote for the most quote unquote electable candidate. What's going on here? Why hasn't that been the case? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, Bailey was arguing um, that, as Nathaniel was saying, that Irvin is kind of this closet liberal, and the Democrats have, of course, kind of seized on to that to boost um, Bailey then as um, a more conservative candidate. I There's not a really great explanation for— because. Up until a few weeks ago, Irvin had seemed like the favorite. He was leading in the polls, but now recent polls here in early and late June have put Bailey at 32 percent, Irvin at the mid to high teens. Um, his campaign ads have expired in like Southern Illinois, which means he's just not funding as much. Also, um, one of the main people who was fueling his campaign, um, Griffin, who is a venture capitalist in the state. He, or sorry, a hedge fund um, donor in the state. He is kind of pulled out and is moving his fund from Chicago to Miami. So he kind of just fizzled out as a candidate. It's not terribly clear to me why that has happened. Um, but to your point, right now, it looks like Illinois is going to elect a more Trumpier Republican in the primary. And in theory, that won't play well in the general. All right. Keeping up the pace here, let's move from Illinois to New York. We don't have quite as much to cover there because They've pushed off the House races to August, but the incumbent governor, Kathy Hochul, who of course stepped in as governor after Cuomo resigned last year, uh, she's running for re-election for her first full term, and she's got competition from New York City's public advocate, Jumani Williams, on her left flank, and on her right flank, Representative Tom Swosey. What's at stake here? Uh, I... I think we can say that this race isn't that competitive, but will we learn anything from the margins? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not sure that much is at stake because I think Democrats are going to win this race in the fall, no matter what. You know, I suppose theoretically, you know, if, if Jumani Williams, the progressive candidate were to win, you know, that could be a, you know, a significant moment, um, given that New York has been 
uh, historically governed by more moderate governors. Um, but Willington's campaign has really not gotten off the ground. His fundraising has been really poor. Um, he hasn't held a lot of events, perhaps because his wife um, is sick with cancer. Um, so it really looks like Hochul is going to waltz to the nomination. That said, though, Nathaniel, I thought you'd made an interesting point about the lieutenant governor primary in your preview, and it could be kind of like a split ticket, essentially. Yeah. So in New York, um, the governor and lieutenant governor candidates run in separate primaries, but then in the same ticket in the general election. Um, and like each governor candidate has like a handpicked choice for lieutenant governor. Um, so like Williams has a progressive candidate, Archila, and um um, like Hochul has her choice, Antonio Delgado, but Delgado actually was a late replacement for Hochul's old lieutenant governor who resigned in disgrace due to corruption. Well, and um, was arrested, so, arrested by the FBI. Right, yes. Um, so so Delgado has had a, a bit of a, you know, he's been thrown into things just a couple of months ago. So he's playing catch up a little bit. Um, and Williams' uh, lieutenant governor candidate, by contrast, Archila is is looking pretty strong. She looks like she has a, a appeal that extends beyond just Williams supporters. So it's not out, out of the question that Archila could defeat Delgado, and then you'd have a progressive lieutenant governor, but a more moderate governor in Kathy Hochul, and that could lead to a lot of tension in Albany over the next four years. All right, traveling across the country to Colorado, there are two things I want to talk about. There's a competitive Senate election coming up in the general this fall. So there are couple Republicans vying to try to replace incumbent Democrat Michael Bennett. The other thing I want to talk about is the Republican Secretary of State and Governor's primary races there, where they're also trying to unseat Democrats. And the folks on the Republican side who are trying to unseat Democrats are pretty big, big lie supporters, which seems to have become a sort of trend in Colorado and maybe out West in general. But uh, Nathaniel, what is at stake there? Yeah, this is another case where I think electability is is a big concern for Republicans and whether these races are competitive is going to be decided by who wins the primary. So Colorado, as folks probably know, you know, he used to be a swing state has really moved toward Democrats in the age of Trump. It's now kind of right on the cusp of competitiveness in a red wave election like 2022 could turn out to be. You could see it being competitive, but I think you'd have to give Democrats the edge by default. Um, if Republicans nominate Ron Hanks for Senate and uh, Tina Peters for Secretary of State, um, those are, as you mentioned, Galen, the the two big, big lie supporters. Um, they are probably too conservative, too extreme in order to win in Colorado. And then I think Democrats can not worry about the state in the fall. Um, but the um, the more moderate candidates uh, in those races probably could win. So for example, in the Senate race, um, Joe O'Day is is actually a pro-choice Republican, which of course is, is very um, you know, unheard of these days. And so you could see him as well as Pam Anderson in the Secretary of State's race, who is, um, she's the... Uh, the election administrator in Jefferson County, which is like a very kind of your stereotypical genteel suburban county uh, in Colorado. You could see them having appeal with a lot of the voters in Colorado who used to vote Republican kind of before Trump became the, the face of the Republican Party, but have moved away from the party in recent years. Yeah. And it's another instance in the Senate race in particular where Democrats are trying to back the Trumpier candidate um, because they think there'll be a weaker general election uh, match. And it's just, you know, I hope Democrats know what they're doing, right? <laughs> in for the their sense own sake. of um, for their own sake. It's an interesting strategy. Um, I understand the logic of it, but it definitely has more risks than I think they perhaps realize. Yeah, Tina Peters, as longtime listeners to the podcast um, might know from Kaylee Rogers' reporting, um, is the Mesa County clerk who uh, used to oversee elections there, but who uh, has been removed from her job overseeing elections for 2022, at least, because she allegedly compromised the security of um, voting machines in the 2020 election. And has several felony charges against her. Although, even if you're not a longtime listener, you probably still heard about that, because I only think we talked about it two months ago. Um, but uh, uh, okay, moving on. We have two more states to cover, and then we're going to leave the rest to the live blog tomorrow. Oklahoma. There are actually two U.S. Senate elections taking place there this year. I'm going to take a wild guess and assume they aren't competitive, but of course, there is still a competitive Republican primary. So what is at stake in Oklahoma? 
So one of those Senate races, Galen, is not actually that competitive. Uh, Republican Senator James Lankford looks like he's going to win renomination just fine. The other one, though, is a special election, and that has already attracted 13 candidates, one of which is Representative Mark Wayne Mullen. And so that means the second congressional district is also on the ballot on Tuesday, and there are 14 candidates running for that House district. And this is just a race where, you know, it's pretty challenging to kind of suss out who will end up prevailing, namely because, you know, it's a very red state, but there's just not a ton of polling and a lot of money is being spent. It looks like, Mark, that Mullen in the Senate race should prevail. There's a close race for second, maybe with T.W. Shannon, who's a House speaker in Oklahoma and is the first black person to hold that office. A little bit behind him in the polls there, though, and the crowded field beneath um, Shannon makes it a little bit challenging to understand, you know, to what extent he'll be able to shore up the vote there. Yeah, I got to say, these races in Oklahoma are so crowded, they're probably both going to go to runoffs as well. So given how many other races there are to focus on on the June 20th ballot, I'm kind of mentally putting Oklahoma in a drawer and saying, I'll pay closer attention to these uh, in August. (laughs) All right, well, let's shut that drawer for now and talk about Utah, where incumbent representative Blake Moore is facing more conservative challengers in the Republican primary for the first district. Does it look like he could lose re-nomination? I think Moore is going to be fine. I'm more interested in the Senate race there. Mike Lee, who folks might know, is kind of this archetypal conservative Tea Party Republican. Um, He is is very likely— He's been on this podcast. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. He's very likely going to win renomination, but he's in a unique position because he is facing not a Democrat, but independent former Republican Evan McMullen in the general election. So it will be interesting to see if he only gets like 50 percent support in the the primary against uh, kind of his his scattered um, Republican opposition. Um, Maybe there is genuinely a large segment of the Republican base in Utah that's unhappy with him and might consider voting for McMullen, especially since his two primary challengers are actually um, from the less Trumpy side, um, which is kind of unusual when you think about primary challengers so far this year. So so that final number for Lee, I think, could be telling. And of course, Evan McMullen famously ran for president in 2016 after Trump won the nomination and got a fair amount of support in Utah. It's a Trump skeptic state. Or has been. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, have, so we'll see what Republicans do. Have Democrats coalesced around supporting Evan McMullen as the independent, or are they trying to put up a, you know, a proper Democrat as well? Yeah, they actually, in an unusual and controversial move, they um, decided not to nominate their own candidate and to um, to kind of clear the field for McMullen, which a lot of Democrats who feel that like McMullen isn't a real Democrat, and he, he's not, he's not a, actually a Democrat by any at all. Definition. Um, We're upset by that. All right. In favor of time, we are going to pick up on Nebraska and South Carolina on the live blog tomorrow. So make sure to check us out on 538.com. But let's wrap up today with Mississippi, where uh, it looks like some House incumbents are being challenged as a broader trend that we've talked about here on the podcast. Yeah. So in Mississippi, Republicans are holding two runoffs in the third and fourth congressional districts where um, incumbents were were forced into a runoff. One of those is expected, uh, Steve Palazzo, who is the subject of a campaign finance probe. Um, He's probably going to lose. But the other one wasn't. That's uh, Michael Guest in the third district. And he he's not like particularly anti-Trump or anything like that, but he did vote to authorize a bipartisan January 6th commission. And that apparently uh, was enough to get challenger Michael Cassidy the momentum to hold guest under 50%. So that one's going to be competitive too. Um, but yeah, Galen, you know, you mentioned kind of incumbents being in trouble in general uh, on Tuesday. That's definitely a trend. We have two incumbent versus incumbent primaries in Illinois um, between uh, both one on the Republican side, one on the Democratic side. So at least two incumbents are going to lose in primaries tomorrow. That is guaranteed. Um, I think Palazzo probably will as well. So that's three in one night, which is pretty crazy. And then you have Guest in Mississippi. You also have Danny Davis in Illinois who could lose, Doug Lamborn in Colorado who could lose. Um, So honestly, it wouldn't be shocking to see five or six incumbents lose renomination on Tuesday, which itself, I mean, that, that, you know, in, in a normal election year, five or six incumbents losing a primary in 
the entire year would be a shockingly high number, but we could get that many just in one night, uh, which is pretty remarkable. Now, some of those, though, are redistricting, at least the two in Illinois. The two in Illinois, you know, they got thrown together in yeah. redistricting. Um, but in Mississippi, you know, those, the, you know, it's because of scandal. It's because right. of, you know, guests uh, kind of not towing the party line. Um, in Illinois, um, the, the Danny Davis race, that's a, um, like, urban central Chicago district where a progressive challenger, Kena Collins, is challenging this longtime representative, Danny Davis. So it, and that's, that wasn't changed too much by redistricting. So if she's successful, that would be kind of a classic, you know, AOC, Ayanna Presley style upset. Um, so you'd actually get a few no- that are not redistricting related as well. Yeah, no, I just wanted to stress that I feel like there's three right. themes, right? Like there's the incumbent versus incumbent because of redistricting. That's harder to kind of necessarily read a lot into. But then as you're saying on the Democratic side, the progressive versus incumbent challenge. But then on the Republican side, which has been really interesting this year, not unique to this Tuesday, has been true in other primaries as well, but is the contest um, candidate kind of running against the incumbent generally speaking, because they haven't been Trumpy enough and not necessarily prevailing, but to your point, like cutting into the margin enough that it still speaks something about where that party is headed. All right. Well, That is it for today. As I mentioned, we will meet back up on the live blog and we will be podcasting later this week as well. For now, thank you, Sarah and Nathaniel. Thanks, Galen. Thanks, Galen. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Anthony Luciani is on audio editing. Chadwick Matlin is our editorial director. And Emily Vineski is our intern. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we will see you soon.